You're watching ADTV. Unmasking the Antichrist. Now, this subject is going to be predominantly, we're going to talk about it predominantly from the vantage point of Daniel chapter 7. And those of you who were here last night, we spent a great deal of time in Daniel chapter 2. And Daniel chapter 2, as you will see, will prove as a foundation for what we're going to look at tonight. The book of Daniel chapter 2 discussed a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, but this evening we're going to look at Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has a dream. And Daniel does not understand, well actually he does understand this dream. Uh, Daniel 2, he was brought in to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and he did so with amazing uh, clarity. So Daniel 7, we're going to look at what Daniel dreams and what its emphasis is to us today. Daniel 7 verse 2 says, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Verse 3 says, and four great, what's that next word everyone? Beast. Beast came up from the sea, each different from the other. So here, picture in your mind, Daniel here, he has a dream. And in this dream, he has a dream of four distinct different beasts coming up from the sea. Okay. Now there has been much um, debate about what a beast symbolizes in Bible prophecy. Some will say that a beast represents a, a computer or, or something else. They'll, they'll, they'll make up interpretations, but last night as we discussed, the best interpreter of the Bible, what's his name? Do you know his name? The Bible, right? The Bible is its own interpreter, right? We are, we're on very dangerous ground, friends, when we go to somewhat what another man thinks and ask him, what do you think this means? The best thing for us to do is to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about itself. That way we can't be caught up in error. So let's take a look at what the Bible says, what a beast represents or symbolizes. Verse 17 says, those great beasts which are four are for what everyone? Kings. Kings which shall arise out of the earth. The Bible goes even further in verse 23 to make it even more plain. It says in verse 23, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth, what? Kingdom. kingdom upon earth. So the fourth beast represents the fourth kingdom. So if the fourth beast represents the fourth kingdom, then the first three beasts must represent what? The first three kingdoms. Do you see? So when you see a beast in symbolic Bible prophecy, a beast is a kingdom. Now let me ask you a question. Do we do that today in our modern society when it comes to nations? For example, when you think of the great country of Canada, which animal comes to mind? Beaver. A beaver, that's right, a beaver. When you think about the United States of America, what animal comes to mind? Eagle. The eagle. So we still do that today, don't we? we? We've actually borrowed this idea from the mind of God himself because God was the, the one who came up with this idea. So here we have these four beasts that are four, these four kingdoms. And as we looked at last night, the four world ruling empires that intimately affected the people of God were these four kingdoms. And we looked at them last night. Babylon, which represented the head of gold. Uh, Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, which represented the chest and arms of silver. Uh, the Grecian power, the ancient Greek power led by Alexander the Great, the thighs of bronze. The legs of iron, which represented the Roman uh, monarchy, the iron monarchy of Rome. And then lastly, divided Europe, how Rome would be divided into ten parts. And we looked at that last evening. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its, throne, uh, till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now last night, what was the first nation we looked at? Do you remember? Babylon. Exactly. Babylon. And this is exactly what we find with the lion. 
um, the winged lion. In fact, the Bible even tells us exactly what the lion represents. If you look here in Jeremiah 4, it says, The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. Continuing in verse 13, it says, And his chariots like a whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. So this was in the time of Jeremiah, and those of you who have ever studied the book of Jeremiah will know that what was Jeremiah's main message to the people of God? He was warning them about the attack of Babylon, right? About how they were going to be taken into Babylonian captivity. So here he is describing Babylon as a lion with eagle's wings, right? Now if you go over to ancient Babylon today, and, and um, well actually ancient Babylon today is a war zone because right now that's where Iraq is, right? But it, if you find what has been excavated from Babylon, you'll find some very interesting artifacts. You'll see here winged lions. This was found in ancient Babylon. Also these golden uh, carvings of two winged lions. So but Babylon was synonymous even in, in its very own time with these winged lions. And that's how the Bible says Babylon was described there. But the Bible doesn't stop there with that, but it goes and describes another beast. It says, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was lifted up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now, it's interesting, this lion has interesting characteristics. The first one that is very interesting is one side of it is higher than the other, right? Did you notice that in what we just read? And then the other interesting characteristic or interesting characteristic about this uh, bear is what does it have in its mouth there? What do you see there? Three ribs, right? So what does that mean? Well, if you look in ancient history, you will find, you will discover that for the Medo-Persian Empire to rise to prominence, they took over three world-ruling empires. The first, it traveled northwest to attack and to overthrow the nation of Lydia um, up there in, in, in that area. Then Babylon straight west, it went over to take Babylon, and finally it went southwest to overthrow Egypt. And again, friends, this was written hundreds of years before this actually took place. Um, it's, it's really amazing. The next beast we will look at here, it says, After this I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Now, I don't know how many zoologists we have in our midst this evening, but let me ask you a question. What is a leopard known for? Speed. Speed, absolutely. A leopard is a very fast animal. In fact, the cheetah is faster, but the leopard is pretty close. Leopard is a really fast animal. But notice this, not only is this leopard just fast, but what, is, what does it have on its back? Four wings. So we're, not ta we're talking about a turbocharged leopard, okay? We're talking about a super fast leopard. This leopard is so fast, it has four wings, and it is a leopard. But it also has four heads. We'll get to that also in just a moment. Let's keep reading in verse uh, 6. It says, The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So... Very interesting. Now here is a, a look at where uh, Greece was, the ancient Greece, I should say, from 331 to 168 BC. And Greece was a very powerful empire led by Alexander the Great. And those of you who are really wanting to get in the details, this slide here describes, even in the Bible itself, how God foresaw that Medo-Persia would be overtaken by Greece. Isn't that isn't amazing? Let me read it to you. It says, The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So here we have a ram, but then in verse 21, another beast is described. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, or the king of Greece. And, that, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And if you read that whole context, you'll discover that this rough goat smote this this ram and stomped upon him and killed him, symbolizing how ancient Greece would overtake Medo-Persia. Startling, it's right there in the Bible. Now, Alexander the Great, just a word on him, a little historical um, quote here about Alexander. It talks about him by saying, he was a master in the combination of various arms. He taught the world the advantages of campaigning in winter, the value of pressing pursuit to the utmost, and the principle of march divided, fight united. 
He marshaled usually in two divisions, one conducting the impediments in his own traveling light. His speed of movement was extraordinary. It is said that he attributed his military success to never putting anything off. So here historians say that Alexander, his speed was what? Extraordinary. He took over the world in 10 short years at a very young, at a very young age. The enormous distances traversed in unknown countries imply a very high degree of organizing ability. In 10 years, he had only two serious breakdowns. Had a lesser man attempted what he achieved and failed, we should have heard enough of the hopeless military difficulties of the undertaking. Do you see what that author is saying? He's saying if anyone even attempted what Alexander the Great did, we would all still be talking about how, what, a, what a hopeless guy he was, right? But in other words, Alexander did wonderful things. That's why he has the last name, the Great, right? Alexander the Great, I don't, not really his last name, that's what he's called, right? But anyway, Alexander the Great was great because of what he did and, um, in such a short time. Now, when Alexander the Great died, there was an amazing controversy surrounding his death. Verse 22 of Daniel tells us about it. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. Alexander the Great could not conquer himself. He could conquer the whole world, but yet he was uh, driven. He, he, one night he drank himself to death, actually. He drank so much that he died. And it's a shame that such a great uh, mind would be driven to, to, to killing himself through alcohol, right? And that's still happening today. A lot of people are doing the very same thing with, with alcohol. Now, history bears witness about Alexander, about his four generals. It says, of Alexander's generals at his death, Benjamin Wheeler says the following, each one wedded the sword against the other, and the empire went down in a tangle of strife and carnage. With the close, with the close of the, the century, it resolved itself into four well-ascertained domains. So when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was, was going to be given over to his son. But when he, when he died, his son was so young that his son could not really um, manage a kingdom very well. So it was, ended up being divided amongst his four generals. And do you remember in Daniel 7, we just looked at the leopard having four heads? This represents the, the divisions of the Grecian, ancient Grecian Empire, and it was divided up into his, with his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And you can find that in your secular history books. So that's exactly what took place over there back then. Now the fourth beast we're going to look at here is a very interesting looking beast. I hope you won't see him at the Vancouver Zoo. If you did, you might want to run the other way, right? He looks pretty gruesome. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge, what kind of teeth? Iron teeth. Now, did we hear about that anywhere else in, Daniel, in the book of Daniel? The iron monarchy of Rome, right? The Roman power. So this beast is pictured with great iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was, what's that next word? It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So something about this fourth beast would be seen later on to be different than the previous three beasts. And um, that's very interesting. In fact, we'll talk about that in just a moment. What about this kingdom of Rome? It says on June 22nd, 168 BC at the Battle of Pydna, perished the empire of Alexander the Great 144 years after his death. This is pretty much the solidified the date of 168 BC in which um, Rome took prominence over Alexander's kingdom. So there you have Rome from 168 all the way to 476 AD. Uh, the German historian Ferdinand Schlegel says, it was if the iron-footed god of war actually bestrode the globe and every step, every step struck out new torrents of blood. Speaking of the power and the might of, of Rome. Quite vivid words. Plutarch says the victories of Rome were not reckoned by the numbers of the slain or the greatness of the spoils, but by the kingdoms that were taken, by the nations that were conquered, by the isles and continents which were added to the vastness of their empire. So this was, this was what Rome was all about, taking over quickly. Now, after Rome came up, 
we learned last night that Rome was divided to ten parts. Uh, in 476 AD it was divided into what we have now, modern Europe, and we looked at this last evening, but these are the, the tribes, um, the Franks, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Suevi, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and so forth. Ten tribes Rome was divided into, and those tribes today make up modern Europe. So, up to this point, we've just simply reviewed what we looked at last night with a little bit more detail. Daniel 2, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, dividing of Rome. Daniel 7, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and dividing of Rome. Same thing, just a little bit more detail. But we're going to look at some information now that it's going to be pretty shocking to some of us. And I want to say before I get to who this power is today, that if you were a member of this kingdom, the worst thing you can do is get up mad and leave, and when I disclose who it is. Because if it were me, and I have had family members a part of this kingdom, I would want to stay and listen to what the speaker has to say fully before I make my decision. Does that make sense? Does that seem fair? So, so please, when I just show who it is from history and from the Bible, it's actually me. I'm really not going to tell you anything you can't even already tell on the screen. It's going to be very plain. So please stay in your seat and just consider the information. Okay. Now, as Daniel was looking at this beast, this beast with ten horns, he was looking intently at this beast, and as, as, as he was considering the horns on his head, he saw something very striking. He says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Okay. So here is Daniel. He's looking at this beast with the ten horns. He's looking at it very carefully, and then he notices all of a sudden another little horn starts to come up, and he's very interested in that. He's like, what is this all about? Well, it's interesting that the Bible uses the phrase that the little horn comes up among them, right? Now, if I tell you, I have saved you a seat among these other seats, what would that mean if I said that? I have saved you a, a seat among these seats on the right side. If I said that, you would know that there has to be a seat near you that's where you should sit, right? Among. So this gives us a geographic clue about this little horn power. Do you see what I'm saying? This little horn power cannot come up in North America. This little horn power cannot come up in the Middle East. It cannot come up in Asia. It cannot come up in Australia, friends. This little horn power must have risen from Western Europe. I mean, it's very plain. It comes up among the ten, and we've already looked at this, um, the other part. Now, let's keep, keep reading in verse 8. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Okay, so here we have these ten horns once again, but in order for this little horn to start coming up among them, three horns of the ten must be completely uprooted. You follow what I'm saying? Three horns must be taken out of, taken up by the roots in order for this little horn to come up. Now, if you go to your Strong's Concordance and you looked up this word plucked there, you see on your screen, you'll find an interesting definition. Um, the, the Hebrew word plucked, uh, the, the word there is aquar or something to that nature. I'm not a theologian, but I'm doing my best up here. This word plucked means to actually means to exterminate, to totally annihilate. So when we see that word plucked, it means to destroy. And will history bear true what this is? Absolutely. And we'll see that in just a little bit. But it means to destroy, to exterminate. Verse 8, let me read it to you again. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a what? Of a man. And a mouth speaking what kind of words? Pompous words. Now what is a pompous word? Is any, can anyone give me a synonym for the word pompous? Proud, right? Proud. If you, you see someone speaking pompously, they're speaking pridefully, right? So here we have a power who has the eyes like the eyes of a man, and yet he's speaking pridefully or very pompously, okay? Very interesting clues. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. If I say something shall arise, am I talking past, present, or future? future. Talking future, right? And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise when? After them. Okay? We're seeing the ten horns come up after the fourth beast, and then we have the little horn coming up after the ten. Very interesting. 
and he shall be diverse from the first horns, and he shall subdue three kings. Okay, this is very, very interesting. Now let's talk about the three kings for just a moment. In order for the little horn power to come up into prominence, three kings had to be, or three, three empires had to be uprooted. And did this happen? Actually, it did happen. In 493 AD, the tribe of the Heruli was uprooted, vanquished, exterminated. Today we would call that genocide. That's exactly what happened in 493 AD. They were completely uprooted. The second tribe was the Vandals. Now, again, last night I mentioned, has anyone ever heard the word vandalism before? You heard the word, right? Vandalism. Well, that word actually came about because the Vandals used to how do you, vandalize, for lack of a better word, they used to vandalize certain statues in a certain empire. And that didn't go over very well, and they were one of the reasons they were exterminated, actually. They also had a different religious belief also. So, very interesting. So the Vandals were also exterminated. And then finally, in 538, the Ostrogoths were exterminated, completely vanquished from the face of the earth. And this was all foretold in the Bible, and history bears witness that this happened exactly. Now, again, these uh, tribes we looked at last night, the Alamanni, which later became the Germans, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suebi, the Portuguese, and the Visigoth, the Spanish. But the three tribes that rose up with them are no longer in existence today. They're all gone. Very, very sad. Now, I'm going to take some time for just a moment to describe to you what Paul said about this very same power, the little horn. Now, in the Bible, you'll find this power described in different ways. You'll find it described as the Antichrist power. You'll find it described as the little horn or the man of sin. But they're talking about the same power. It's just different words. And Spurgeon vindicates that. Many other, the great Bible expositors, say the same thing. So let me read to you 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Back in the days of the Thessalonian church, Thessalonica church, they believed that Jesus was coming any moment. They really believed Jesus was coming very soon back then in Paul's day, right? So Paul is writing to them. He's saying, listen, don't get so worked up. Don't get so excited. The coming of Jesus isn't going to come until these things happen before, right? They were getting all worked up into an emotional frenzy. And he said, no, let me describe to you what must happen first before Christ comes. Verse 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the second coming, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, if you look in your concordance, the word, the phrase, a falling away first, you know what you'll find? You'll find an interesting word. It's apostasia. And that's where we get our word today, apostasy, right? So what Paul was saying was there has to be a, a happen a falling away from the truth first before Jesus comes. There has, that has to happen before Jesus comes. But not only that, he goes on to say, and that man of sin, what's those next two words? Be what? Revealed. The son of perdition. So the Bible says there must be, must two, two things must happen before Jesus comes. Number one, there must be a great apostasy in the Christianity. The truth being cast down to the ground. That's number one. Number two, the man of sin or the Antichrist being revealed. Now this is very, very interesting, friends, because this teaching flies in the face of 50% of Christianity today. Did you know that? Most, half of Christianity today, actually I would say more than half, they say that once we are gone, raptured, then the Antichrist will be revealed. Right? That's what a lot of Christianity says today. But if you read the Bible carefully, friends, it doesn't say that. It says the Antichrist is revealed when? First. And then Christ's coming can be possible. And I'll show you that uh, the rest of this evening in the further lecture. So this is what the Bible says. The man of sin is to be revealed. And how does the Bible describe him? Look at that next, the, the phrase that isn't highlighted right after that. What does it call him? The son of what? Perdition. Perdition. The, friends, those of you who study your Bibles, can you tell me the only other place this is found in the Bible? There's only one other instance this is used. Judas. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Judas. Judas is the one that is described as the son of perdition. And how did Judas betray Jesus Christ? Did, did Judas come up to, to Jesus and punch him in the face? Is that how Ju Judas betrayed Jesus? No. What did he do? He kissed him, right? He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Friends, I submit to you that the Antichrist will do the very same thing. Many people are looking for some dark, sinister figure. They're thinking of, what's the guy's name, Nikolai, whatever, that the books from the left behind. They're looking for some dark guy, some sinister individual. But the Antichrist is going to look so much like Jesus that the whole world is going to be deceived. And I'll show you that this evening. You'll see it. Verse 4 says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is what the Antichrist will do. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. You see, Paul spoke to the Thessalonians directly and told them all of these things, but he, he, he's just reminding them of he told them before. Verse 6, and now you know that what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And that's kind of confusing, the old Elizabeth, Elizabethan English. So the, basic, the Bible in basic English says, there is one who is keeping back the evil till he's taken out of the way. In other words, what Paul was saying here was, in order for the Antichrist to rise, there has to be this something else has to be taken out of the way for the Antichrist to rise to prominence. In other words, there's something that's keeping it back from growing, right? There's something that's keeping it down. But he's saying when this is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will rise. Verse 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and, what are those next two words? Lying wonders. Now, friends, let me say this. One time, I'll give you a, a, what happened to me one time. I was in Oklahoma, and I was studying with a lovely family in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, actually. And um, we had to go to the hospital because one of their friends was a, a perpetual drunk. He always used to get drunk, and he was at our Bible study, drunk, and, you know, we let anyone come in, right? Anyway, he was, he was there, and uh, the guy was on a porch, right, a tall porch, and he fell off the porch. It was like a nine-foot drop-off, and he fell down. And we thought he had a concussion or he almost died. So we took him to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, after a while, they said he was fine. He was absolutely, you know, he, was, he could go back home. He, I guess he was so drunk it didn't bother him so much, right? Anyway, what happened was, is I was waiting in the waiting room, and I saw this documentary. I think it was on uh, Dateline or 2020 or one of those shows. And it was about a man who was walking the streets of uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and he called himself, what's his name? That was his name. What's his name? That's quite a name to go by, right? His name was what's his name. And what's his name, what he would do is what's his name would be dressed up as the um, stereotypical view that we have in our minds of Jesus. He would have white robes on. He would have a beard. He would have, uh, you know, he would look like what we would think what Jesus would look like. And he would go around the city streets and he would heal the sick people. He would heal them. He would go and help them with their problems. And they were interviewing people on the street, and I'll never forget this. And they put the, the microphone in this uh, young man's, uh, near his mouth there, and they said, Sir, what do you think about this man? Do you think he's from God? And the young man said, He has to be from God. He's working miracles. No one else can work miracles because, because only God can do that. And I remember that, friends, because I was reading just that morning about 2 Thessalonians 2. And the Bible says that Satan himself will do lying wonders and miracles. So just because someone does a miracle, that doesn't mean they're from God at all. In fact, Satan in Exodus used these magicians of Egypt to also work miracles, right? So just because someone says, oh, they're a miracle worker, they have to be from God, I would put a big question mark on their ministry. I really would, seriously. And there's a lot of others we could talk about, but we'll, we'll leave that for another evening. Um, and it goes on by saying in verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Friends, do you think truth is important this evening? Absolutely. You know, it's kind of sad to me. I wish this place was packed. I wish we, you know, but we sent out invitations to hear truth and look how many people come. Isn't that sad? People are more concerned about uh, other things, Right? But yet they're going in a wrong path, and it, I hope that they'll see the truth one day. Now, here's a statement from Grotten Guinness, and he says, Here we have a point 
on which Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. The early church knew, he says, what the hindrance was. The early church tells us what it did know upon the subject, and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had by word of mouth only told the Thessalonians. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. Now basically what Mr. Guinness is saying here is that today people are saying, well, the power that was holding back the Antichrist was this or that, or they were just speculating. He says, we can't just speculate. We have to go to see what the early church fathers believed. That's the only way we could find what was true in this, this instance. And what did they say? Uh, Tertullian writes in uh, 200 AD, he says, He who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state? The falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms shall introduce Antichrist. So what was he saying? He was saying that when Rome falls, guess who else is going to rise up? The predicted Antichrist power. That's exactly what he was saying. Another historian says, Only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. That is when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way. Then he, Antichrist, shall come. That was written in, in 390. Another statement, we have the consenting testimony of the early church fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of St. John, down to Chrysostom and to Jerome to the effect that it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome. So all of these expositors are on the same page that once Rome falls, pagan Rome, another power will come up and that will be the Antichrist power. Okay. One more, actually a couple more statements here. While the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. And another statement about the same thing. It says, Paul did not identify the restraining power which they knew to be Rome for fear of reprisals or retaliations. Remember the Christian church was under persecution by Rome. So Paul, some people wonder, they say, well, if it was Rome, why didn't Paul just spell it out right there in the letter? You know, why didn't Paul just write, okay, when Rome falls, then watch out. You know, why didn't he just say that? Well, the problem was, is during that time, the church was being persecuted by Rome. So if he wrote that in the letter, it would probably have been destroyed and we probably would have never had it today. So this is the, the simple reason why Paul didn't say it outright. He kind of cloaked it with language that would kind of help us to study and dig a little deeper. So the little horn power, the Bible says it would be diverse from the first horns. Now I'm going to give you 13 characteristics, I'm going to list them on the screen, and you should be able to tell me who this power is. Okay, it may not be comfortable, it may not be the politically correct thing to do, and like I said at the outset of this meeting, I have had family members that were a part of this system, and I'm not talking about anyone or any individual, what I'm talking about this evening and really what the Bible is talking about is a kingdom. It is a, it is a kingdom that God is uh, not, doesn't hold in high esteem, that's for sure. So let's take a look at these 13 characteristics. Number one, it would arise or it would, be, it would come up out of the which beast? The fourth beast. Now please make me proud. What was the fourth beast? What empire was it? Do you remember? Rome. That's right. So this little horn power, what kind of roots does it have? You tell me if it comes out of Rome. It has Roman roots, right? It comes out of the Roman Empire, so its roots are Roman. It comes out of the fourth beast. Number two, it arose among the ten horns. In other words, it rose in the same geographic location as the ten horns were. It was in, in, in Europe. Right? It didn't come up in South America, didn't come up in Africa, didn't come up in the Middle East. It came up in Europe. Okay? So, there's another characteristic to consider. Number three, it would come up after the ten horns already came up. Now, the ten horns, they came up by the year 476 A.D. That was when all the ten horns, that's when they were divided in 476 A.D. So, this little horn power could not come up before 476. It had to come up sometime after. 476 A.D. Okay, number four. Somehow this little horn was a little bit different than the other horns. There was some component about it that was a little bit different than the previous ten horns. And you'll see what that is in just a moment. Number five. 
This horn was more stout than the others. Who knows the word stout? What does that mean? Big or strong, right? This little horn, even though it was little, was more strong than the other horns. It's kind of, it's kind of strange. It was small, but yet it became stronger than all the others around it. Number six, it uprooted three kingdoms. In other words, for it to come to power, three kingdoms had to be exterminated in order for it to rise up. Okay? Number seven, in this little horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and he spoke great words, or some versions say pompous words, against God. So, in this little horn, there was a man at the head of it who spoke against God. Pompous words, blasphemous words. Number eight, this power would wear out the saints. Now, what is a saint? Do I have any saints in here this evening? Can I, can I see your hands? I see a few saints. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, saints, the Bible speaks of saints as, in Revelation 14, 12, of those who keep God's commandments, right? Sometimes we have a, a picture in our mind, uh, a picture of a saint being someone who, who never sees the outside world, right? They're in their, you know, they never leave their house or whatever. But that's not what the Bible says. But this power would wear out the saints. Now, what does that mean, wear out? When I was young, I'm from the south, so, uh, North Carolina. I don't know if you've ever been down there before. But when I used to do bad things, believe it, when I was young, I, believe it or not, I used to do bad things when I was little. I wasn't always a saint. But, um, Anyway, <laughs> anyway, I used to do bad things when I was little, and my dad used to say, boy, if you do that again, I'm going to wear you out. And what did that mean? I, I un interpreted that at my age as he's going to take out his belt and beat me, right? In a nice, loving way, of course, you know. But anyway, to wear out in this context means to persecute. I was being persecuted by my dad, but I wasn't doing anything righteous, so it was actually, um, it was good that he wore me out. Dad, if you're watching, thank you for that. Uh, number nine, also, this little horn power would think to change times and laws. And friends, this one, this num number nine right there, this one is so explosive, I can't even touch it tonight. I might explode myself. I can't touch it tonight. We have this one coming th this coming week. It's called the Mark of the Beast crisis. You don't want to miss that night. If you have plans, cancel them. If you have people you haven't seen in years, bring them to the meeting. What's the next attribute of the little horn power? It would rule for times, times, and a half a time. Don't let that confuse you. We'll, we'll clear it up in just a moment. Number 11, it shall devour how much of the earth? The whole earth. Okay? This, would, this is pretty amazing, especially how this power does it. It's absolutely fascinating to me because it does it in such a way where no one even realizes it's doing it. Isn't that amazing? When you can do something, the whole world, and no one knows you're doing it, I think that's pretty impressive. Um, and this power does it to perfection, as we will see tomorrow night when we talk about secret societies. Number 12, it will exist till the end of time. That's what the Bible says. And number 13, at the very end, dominion would be taken away. Its power would be taken away. Those are 13 identifying characteristics. And friends, believe it or not, there are over 50, I think it's over 53 identifying characteristics. So I'm having a lot of mercy on you this evening. You could be here till to the wee hours of the morning, but I just gave you 13, okay? So these are 13 identifying characteristics. And again, before I disclose on who it is, again, I would like to say that there are millions of people involved in this system tonight that are going to be saved one day, I believe. I believe that they're going to be in heaven. I believe that they're good people. But I just believe that they're in a system that's against God. Okay? So I don't want anyone to get mad. If you get mad at me, that's okay. I don't care. I've been, people have been mad at me before, and they'll probably be mad at me again after tonight. Okay? So let's take a look at C. Let's take a look and see what history says, and we'll see if the biblical criteria adds up to what history says. Is that fair? Let's take a look here. It says, Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states, which central point was the papal C. Therefore, inevitably, resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. Remember how the Bible said that this would be a different type of power? It would be different than the horns that came before it? So, out of the Roman Empire, out of the ashes of the Roman Empire, came up another power that still had the prefix of the word Roman. Right? Perhaps you've heard of it. Let's keep going. In fact, two of the members of this Roman power were Jesuit priests. Two of their most 
uh, very well gifted minds of the, the Roman Catholic Church. Their names were Alcazar and Ribera. So perhaps you've heard of them. They were Jesuit priests. And Alcazar came up with an interesting uh, rule of prophetic interpretation, and that was called preterism. Uh, preterism is the teaching. I hate to give you these theological terms, but I kind of have to. Uh, preterism basically means that the Antichrist came up in the past and we no longer have to worry about the Antichrist anymore. He's, he's off the scene, he's gone. That's preterism. But there was another Jesuit priest, and this teaching that Ribera had is more prominent today. That teaching is called futurism. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to tell me the root word of futurism. What is it? Future, right? Future. So Ribera's teaching was this. He said, the Antichrist is going to come in the future. He's not here now. He's going to come way off in the future sometime. Okay. Now, what do these two teachings do if you look at them logically? Well, preterism gets our eyes to focus on the past and futurism gets our eyes fixed on what? The future, right? And when we do that, what do we not see right in front of us? The present, right? The fact of the matter is that these two priests came up with this to, to destroy something that happened in the 1400s up to the 1700s, and that was called the Protestant Reformation. Maybe you've read about that in your history books before. The Protestant Reformation, and this, this Protestant Reformation basically started out, there was a man by the name of Martin Luther. Actually, he wasn't the one that actually started it, but he was one of the, the, the ones that really brought it to the fore. Uh, Martin Luther, what Martin Luther did was he was a very good Roman Catholic monk. I mean, he wanted to follow the church absolutely to the T. He wanted to do what was right. He had a very good conscience. But as Martin Luther began studying the Bible, he found that there was many differences between what his church, the Roman Catholic Church, taught and what the Bible says. And he didn't want to leave his church at all. He didn't want to. But the more he studied, the more he saw that he could not be in this system. And, and as he studied more and more, he began to find hundreds of errors that the Roman Church did. And we'll talk about them, just a few of them tonight. And again, I'm not saying this to, to, to make anyone feel bad, but I just want to tell you all the truth. Is that, is that fair? Okay, let's keep going. S historian Eckhart says, when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude, barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. So history bears witness that it wasn't only a religious power, but it was a, a religio-political power. The two comprised in one. Okay, and uh, if you go to uh, Rome today, and you just take a look at some of the, uh, the artifacts. I haven't, I've never been to the Vatican myself, but I have friends that have been there, and they've shown me a lot of pictures. And it's amazing that everything you see in the Vatican is encrusted with the old Roman pagan uh, state that preceded it. In other words, it was built upon the ruins of pagan Rome. And it makes sense. It's called the, the Roman Catholic Church. Another statement here, if a man consider the origin of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will e easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. So that's exactly what the Bible said would happen. It would be Rome, be divided into ten, a little horn would come up among them, and well, we'll see what else it says here. It says, long ages ago when Rome through neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule them. And thus commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. And that is exactly what happened. When this happened, the Pope became the leader of all the churches. He actually dominated secular affairs. He told there was actually a, a king in Germany, and we'll see here in just a moment, that actually had to come to, into the snow with bare feet to bow down before the Pope to receive uh, his, his, his pardon. And um, that, that's pretty, pretty amazing, if you ask me. Verse uh, number five, he would be more stout than his fellows. He would be different, and he would humble three kings. Is this what the papacy did? 
Absolutely. There is that, that picture of uh, the artist rendition of this German king who came and bowed down in the snow to the, to the Pope of Rome. And if he didn't, he's, he was in big, in big trouble. And that's just the way it was. Let me ask you another question. Do you think things have changed today? Things haven't changed today. And you'll see as we continue on in this lecture series that things haven't changed at all, especially tomorrow night. We define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold the primacy over three quarters of the world. Is that what it says? What does it say? Over how much of the world? The whole world. This is some serious stuff, right? And um, you never get this by watching CNN, by the way. <laughs> they won't tell you these things. They will give you information that will make you think, wow, now I know what's going on. The news is very interesting now, and you can find some amazing things happening in the news. And every time you look at the newspaper, it screams that Jesus is coming very soon. Another statement here, the vicar of the incarnate Son of God. By the way, that just means the Pope, right? The Pope, anointed high priest and supreme temporal ruler, sat in his tribunal impartially to judge between nation and nation, between people and prince, between sovereign and subject. So, in other words, who has the power here in this picture? Does the God that reigns in heaven, does he have the power? The God in heaven? Father in heaven? No. Who has the power here? The Pope on earth has that power to just do what he wants. And in fact, uh, the late Malachi Martin, uh, he was a Jesuit priest, a, a very interesting book. It's a very thick book, actually. You could probably work out with it. It weighs about 10 pounds. It's huge. He wrote a book called The Keys of This Blood, where he outlined how the Pope, at this time it was Pope John Paul II, and Russia and the West are going for con control of the New World Order. This wasn't a conspiracy theorist. This was a man that knew his stuff inside and out. This is a man that was very articulate and he mapped out exactly what the Roman church was planning. And if you look at it now, what he wrote, that's exactly what's happened. It's amazing. This was written in the early 1980s. So it's a very interesting book now to pick up. Uprooted three kingdoms. Did this little horn power do that? Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others and the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. So, did this power do this? Absolutely. This little horn power uprooted those three kingdoms, those three tribes, the Harry Lai, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, mainly because the religions were different. Did, did the Roman church, by the way, ever persecute because they had a, people had different beliefs back then? Did that ever happen where people were killed? Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll show you that in actually just a moment. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Verse 5 of Revelation 13. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So the Bible speaks in Revelation 13. And we'll, we'll study that out in just a few uh, evenings also. But this is describing the same power, the first beast at least. And it goes on by describing this little horn saying, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, time, and the dividing of time. And right now we just want to focus in on one part of this, and that there's three clues in this verse, but we want to focus in on the fact that he speaks blasphemous words, and he uh, will uh, think to change times and laws. Let me ask you a question before I get into this. If, if you were to go on the streets of uh, this great city, and you were to ask people, Excuse me, sir, ma'am, what do you, can you please tell me what blasphemy is? What would you say, by the way, what would you say blasphemy is? If I ask you, what is blasphemy? What would you say it is? Probably taking the name of God in vain. That's probably blasphemy, right? Maybe, maybe shaking your fist at God and say, God, I want you out of my life. Maybe that's blasphemy. But I want to take you, friends, to what the Bible says. This is an amazing, I tell you, when you see this, it'll blow your mind. When, it, when I first saw this, it gave me, my blood ran cold and my hair stood up on the back of my neck because this is so powerful, friends. Notice what it says. This is what the Bible says about blasphemy, what it is. Jesus here was speaking and he says, I and the Father are what? Are one. Now when Jesus said that, what do you think Jesus was trying to tell the people there? One in thought. One in thought and one that he was God just like the Father is God, right? The Jews answered him saying, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself who? God. 
You see, friends, biblical blasphemy is when a man says that he is God. Jesus could say it because Jesus was one with the Father. He was God, right? So here we see that one picture of biblical blasphemy is when a man claims to be God on earth, right? No other man can claim that, only Christ. Verse 20 says, And seeing their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. This is in Luke 5. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks what? Blasphemies. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Now, question tonight, friends. Can Jesus tonight forgive your sins, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely he can. Now, let's say, for example, um, my wife and I were, were going home after the meeting, and um, we get into an argument. Okay, let's just say uh, this happens, and um, you know, I say some unkind things to her. She says some unkind things to me, and, and, and so forth, and I feel really bad about it. And um, tomorrow night, I come to one of you, and I say, you know what? <sighs> you know, I got into an argument with my wife last night, and I re feel really bad about it. And I was wondering, could you forgive me for that? Could you forgive me for what I did to my wife, yes or no? No, you couldn't forgive me. Now, I could go to my wife and ask forgiveness if I hurt her personally, right? I and mean, then I would have to go to God. But the point I'm making here is that if you sin against, you know, you sin alone and no, against no one else, who do you have to go to for forgiveness? You have to go to God, right? You can't, you can't go to a man. It makes no sense whatsoever. It makes no sense. But this, they called this blasphemy. So the two sides of blasphemy we find in, in the Bible, we find one when a man says he's God on earth and when a man claims he can forgive sin. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some statements from the Roman Catholic Church. This is not, I didn't write these statements. I didn't make them up. I wish I did, actually. It make my life a lot easier. But this is exactly what they said. In the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, Article Pope, page 265, it says, This judicial authority will even include the power to pardon sin. So within, this is, this is Roman Catholic doctrine. You can come to any priest you want and ask him to forgive your sins, right? But is that a biblical thing? No, it's, it's not. Unfortunately, it's not. Here's another one statement. The Catholic priest, page 78, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, one who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. That is from the Catholic priest, page 78. Now, how did Daniel describe the words that this little horn spoke as pompous words? Do these words sound pompous to you, my friends? Absolutely. They're saying that they can forgive sin. And that is absolutely an abomination. Another statement here, Thou art a priest forever, says the ordaining bishop. He is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christus, another Christ. Forever a priest of the Most High with power over the Almighty. So according to Roman Catholicism, the priest has power above God himself. Now, friends, I, I hate to say it, but that is blasphemy. That is pure, unadulterated blasphemy. When, when a man claims to be po more powerful than God, and actually, it's actually very interesting that this phrase here is used, alter Christus, another Christ. You know the word antichrist? Um, many people think it's some weird-looking creature, right, with horns or, you know, some crazy-looking thing that's actually going to appear on the earth. But the word antichrist in the Greek language, most of the time the word anti means not one who is opposed against, but is one who sits in the place of, a substitute. You know how when you're, you're young and you go to your class and, and um, there was nothing that thrilled my heart more when I was in high school where I would go into the classroom and I would see another teacher sitting behind the desk. Because that means I could just do whatever I wanted, right? A substitute teacher came in. But this substitute, you can't do whatever you want. This substitute, they, they say, you have to confess to me. You have to confess your sins to me. And that's exactly, it's exactly the teaching. Another, this is from the same uh, article there. It says, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. Now remember, now you, some might argue and they say, well, look, look at this statement. It was... 1895, so old, right? 
But did you know in Roman Catholicism that once Rome says something, it can never err or can err? So the same thing that was taught way back in 1895 stands fast today as well. So the year has nothing, is really irrelevant to this issue. Another statement here, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests. Who is, who is obliged? God is. He is. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgments of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they, the priests, refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. So again, friends, who has the power here? The priest has power over God. This is what they're saying. I don't agree with that as a Christian, a, a Bible-based Christian. I don't agree with it. It doesn't mean I hate Roman Catholics. I love Roman Catholics. I have had Roman Catholics in my own family. But I just disagree with that point. You know, I just disagree with it. The Pope is of so great dignity and so <laughs> exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. He is likewise the divine monarch and supreme emperor and king of kings. That's very interesting. If you read Revelation, the Bible says who's the king of kings? Christ Jesus, absolutely. So that if, any, that if it were possible that angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, that they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. So if an angel of heaven errs in the faith, the Pope could send him to hell or whatever, right? That's what this is saying. This is, this is mind-blowing stuff. In 1439, the Council of Florence decreed, we define that the Roman pontiff is successor of the blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, and the true vicar of Christ. And, and you know, that, 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 is, that is Roman Catholic teaching that, um, that Peter was the first pope, right? Some of you may, that are Roman Catholic or have been in Roman Catholic churches or used to be Roman Catholic will tell you that's, what, that's why you believe that. But it's interesting, if you ever take time to read that passage of Scripture, maybe tonight you can, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 16, if you read that in its context, you'll discover that when, when Jesus was speaking to Peter there, in the very same context, Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? If you, if you read that context. So, if, if, if the church was built on Peter, and Jesus called him Satan in the very next few verses, that's not a very good foundation, is it? No. So, if you read that passage, actually, Jesus was saying the words that Peter said, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is what the church is built on. Not upon a man. Because if you build a church on a man, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, it goes into apostasy pretty much. Cardinal Bellarmine says, All names which in the scriptures are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. So the reason I give you many statements, friends, is I don't want you to say, oh, he just took one statement. I want to give you a plethora of statements so you'll see that it's true. Uh, blasphemous titles given to the Pope, given in Rome from our palace, the 10th of February, 1817, the 14th jurisdiction of the Most Holy Pontiff of Fa and Father in Christ, and our Lord, our God, the Pope Leo XII. Uh, Rome as it is, page 180. Um, this is from the great encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII. We hold upon the earth, this earth, the place of God Almighty. Now what about Thomas Aquinas? He's a well-noted Roman Catholic uh, uh, theologian of the past, and he said, secular power is subject to the spiritual power as the body is subject to the soul, and therefore it is not a usurpation of authority if the spiritual prelate interfere in temporal things concerning those matters in which the secular power is subject to him. Now, what does this statement do to the doctrine or the belief of the separation of church and state? Does that, is that uphold the, the doctrine of separation of church and state, or does it cast it down? It, it casts it down, doesn't it? Canada and, North, uh, and America especially, we, we believe in the separation of church and state, right? But these, this teaching says, no, the spiritual prelate can interfere into temporal practices. Now, when that has happened in the past, what has been the inevitable result? When, when the religious leaders meddle in pol politics, what happens all the time when this takes place? It's a P word. It begins with P and ends with N. And I'm sure you know what it is. It's persecution, right? Every single time you have the, 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 the religious power commingling, commingling with the temporal power, what happens is the, the, the religious leaders say, you know what, we should deal with this person, this, this group here because they're not with the state-established religion. By the way, did that happen to Jesus Christ as well? 
Absolutely. It was the church people that were responsible ultimately for his death through the Roman army. And it's going to be the same again. The Council of Trent declared, All temporal power is his. The dominion, jurisdiction, and government of the whole earth is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subject and must submit to him. That is what Rome says themselves. Now, how do they do this? Tomorrow night I'll show you how they're doing it and how they're succeeding so well that none of us even know what's going on in the world today. Did they wear out the saints? Let me just show you a few verses here. Uh, we've already looked at verse 5 and verse 7, and I'll show you actually some places that it happened. There was a mouth given to him, great, uh, speaking great things and blasphemies, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That's found in Revelation 13. And if we go to some of the places today, um, here is Thomas Aquinas. He said that, um, convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals. So if you have the name heretic, that can mean anything that you disagree with the Church of Rome, right? I mean, you, you could disagree with them on any minute detail and you would be considered a heretic. Now, I am, I'm, I'm kind of a free, open-minded thinker, right? If you want to worship um, that camera stand, I wouldn't advise you do that, but if you want to do it, I'm not going to kill you if you want to do that, right? I'll let you do your own thing, make your own decisions, right? But the Rome church says, no, you must turn to us. And did that happen in, in Central America also? If you want to do, do some fascinating research, I, I, I highly recommend if you study about Christopher Columbus, right? The real story of Christopher Columbus It's an amazing um, DVD. Uh, I'll give you some more information about that maybe later, but it's pretty interesting. The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted by heresy, she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. In, very amazing. By the way, have we heard anything about torture in the United States of America recently? Actually, we have. We've heard a lot of things about, you know, maybe it's good to torture terrorists, you know, to get information out of them. We think it's okay to do that. Uh, that's, that's not okay. That's, that's, that's actually blasphemous. Here's another statement here. The church has persecuted. Only a tyro or novice in church history will deny that. It's very common knowledge. Uh, the church may by divine right confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their persons, and condemn them to the flames. In our age, the right to inflict the severest penalties, even death, belongs to the church. There is no graver offense than heresy. Therefore, it must be rooted out. So are you telling me that, that is it possible that the church could even take away people's property? Could that happen now, you think? It, it could happen now. And it probably will happen very in the near future. And we'll see, we'll see that a little bit later. But friends, what did we learn last night, by the way, in Daniel chapter 2? What was the one lesson I wanted you to go home with? Who is in control? God is in control, isn't He? So if you know God, if you know Jesus, you don't have to worry about what things are being planned. But it's good to know what's happening so when it happens, you won't be taken by surprise. Now, what about the Inquisition? Now, these aren't bedtime stories. I told you I wasn't going to hold back any truth, so I'm going to try to share with you the truth that, that has been given to me through various researchers. Um, here is uh, the Tower of London and The Hague in the Netherlands. And these were some of the instruments that were used to torture people during this time. I, I kind of hate showing these things because it's kind of, it's not the nicest subject to talk about. But I think the truth needs to be told because it's not being told very much today. And these are some of the instruments of torture that were used. You can take a tour today if you like to see that and go right over there. And here are some of the other things that were shown there. This is in one of the, the dungeons or the basements of the churches. And, this one on your right hand side is, uh, these aren't ankle weights, these are ankle clamps they would put into your ankle and turn them till the screws went into the bone. I know it's grisly details, but that's what happened. They also took these little, this thing here, they would put co coals of fire in it and like burn you in different ways just because you'd believe a different way than the church believed. Another one where they would um, stick this thing around your neck and they would twist this cylinder and it would go right into your throat there and to cut off your, your air. Um, it's really tragic that people would do that. Here's where they would put your necks there, and you probably saw that on, I remember seeing that when I was a little on the cartoons. They would do stuff. It's kind of weird how that's been brought into cartoons and stuff. These were thumb screws that they would put in, and, and this one was really ghastly. Uh, maybe I shouldn't even talk about it, but um, I'll go ahead anyway. Um, this was a, a large stone 
on, on your left side, and they would hoist people up with their hands tied behind them, and then they would kick the stone or roll the stone off this, this, this uh, surface, and it would really rip your arms right out of your sockets. That's what was done. And it was really terrible things that took place. And then not to mention the millions that were burned at the stake, just simply because they didn't want to go along with the established church teaching. And, um, you know, it's very, very sad. And, and I think, you know, we are doomed to repeat um, history if we don't know our history, right? You know, when I, when I was in college, we didn't really talk, they didn't really talk too much about these things anymore. It was always saying, well, you know, that's, there was some persecution, but we really didn't know the, de the detail, right? But these things actually happen. And, uh, and in South Africa, there is this uh, monument that was erected showing how the, the church, the, the woman, the Bible refers to a woman as a church, if you read their scriptures, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it shows here the persecuted woman, the church that followed the Bible, and how they broke away from Rome, and they had the Bible in one hand and the chain on their arm because they broke away from Rome. And um, millions of people came to South Africa because of religious persecution. Now this one again, we don't have time to go into it. It's too controversial. I might get shot tonight, so I don't want to talk about it. We'll talk about that another night. I'll get shot another night. Um, in the interval between the days of the apostles and the conversion of Constantine, rites and ceremonies of which neither Paul nor Peter ever heard crept silently into use and then claimed the ranks of divine institutions. And we'll see that a little bit later. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So the Pope has the power to change whatever he wants to do. He's a powerful dude. You know, don't cross the Pope. You might be in trouble. You might find yourself dead in strange places if you cross the Pope of Rome. Now, now what does this mean? Times, times, and half a time. This is uh, Daniel 7.25. It says, the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Now, what does that mean? That's very interesting wording. Well, if you read your Bible, you will discover that when the Bible says time in a uh, time setting, it signifies one year or 360 days. That was the, the Jewish year was 360 days. Times would be two years or 720 days, and a half a time would be 180 days. Now, if you want to check me out, go to Daniel chapter 4 when you get home and read it, and you'll read about King Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind for seven years, and it says, until seven times passed over him. It was seven years that he was insane, actually, because he went against God. If you go against God, you can be insane, too, so don't do that, okay? Follow what God says, and you'll be all right. Okay, you might have some persecution, but you'll, you'll, be, you'll be at peace in your heart. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time, and if you add that up, you come to the year, or come to the number, 1,260 literal years. Now, why do I say literal years? Well, in several places in the Bible, and I think I have a slide here, Ezekiel 4.6, Numbers 14.34, and Psalm 77.5, the Bible likens a day is equal to a year. Okay, and you can, you can see that even in the ministry of Jesus, he speaks about it himself. So, just think about it. If a power was really powerful and was a very terrible kingdom and did a lot of damage, three and a half years isn't really a long time. But 1260 literal years, that's a longer time. And if the shoe fits, we have a saying, if the shoe fits, what do you do with the shoe? You wear it. So we're going to test this out and see if it fits. 1260 years. With the conquest of Rome by Belisarius commences the history of the Middle Ages, Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. So the papacy began its rule from 538 AD, and if you go into the future, 1260 years, that leads you to the year 1798, okay? 538 to 1798. The Ten Kingdoms were established in 476 AD, then the last of the, the Ostrogoths were annihilated in 538 AD, and then from that point onward, Justinian's decree went into effect, and then the papacy ruled for 1260 years. Okay, and this is, you can find this in your, your history books as well. Some of the newer encyclopedias, they're a little, they're kind of, uh, some of the dates are not quite as, as uh, pristine as they once were, but if you add this up, it comes to 1798. Now, it would be interesting if something happened in 1798. That would be really 
Amazing, right? Let's take a look and see if something happened there. Berthier was the uh, French general, one of the French generals under Napoleon, and Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed, and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So just on time, like the Bible said, in 1798, Napoleon had his, his henchmen march in there. They take the Pope captive because in France there was, a, there was a revolution taking place, right? The French Revolution. And the French Revolution was against God and everything that stood for God because what happened was is the Roman Church did so many things in the name of religion, under the name of religion, that were terrible that um, they said, we don't, we've had enough. So they just took him down. And um, I could kind of understand where the French were coming from, you know. Back when I was young, I was sick of, every, it seemed like every time I turned on the television, there was some scandal about some televangelist, right? Because I lived in North Carolina, and every time they had like Jim Baker or somebody like that, there was always some scandal. So I began to think, well, pff, Christians are all a bunch of idiots, right? So I could kind of see where they're coming from. And um, anyway, the Pope was taken captive, and he had later died in exile. So let's look at this prophecy again. In 476 A.D., the ten, kingdom, ten kingdoms were established after uh, pagan Roman Empire. Then in 538, the bishop was officially recognized by Justinian's decree. And then all the way, 1260 years of time prophecy, Rome during that time persecuted people. Um, you know, it was a terrible time. And, and um, by the way, I just want to say this. Some people get, misunderstand me sometimes, and they'll say, Are you saying that Roman Catholics are all going to go to hell and burn? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there are many people within the system of the Roman Catholic Church that love the Lord with all their heart, and they don't know anything, they don't know anything else. And God does not judge. He's not going to judge them. Oh, you, you did wrong because you didn't know every single detail. He judged according to their knowledge, right? That's the kind of God we serve. We don't serve a God that is against us, that wants to destroy us. Some people think that's the kind of God we serve, right? God is on our side. He wants us to be with Him. But at the same time, He wants us to know the truth because the truth sets us, what? Free. That's right. So, 1260 years of time prophecy leads us up to 1798. And exactly on time, the Pope is taken captive. The papacy dies for a time, but then it's resurrected again. And um, we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow evening. 538 to 1798, 42 months. And you'll find this time period many times in the Bible. I'll show you here in just a moment. In Revelation 12, 6, it describes it as 1,203 score days. Your modern versions will just say 1,260 days because score is 20, right, in the King James language or the Elizabethan language. Um, so 1,260 days, 42 months, time times half a time. They all mean the same thing, just written in a different way. Time times and a half a time, Revelation 12, 14. In fact, if you look through the whole Bible, you will find this time period mentioned seven times. Now, if God says something once, do you think it might be important? It's probably important, right, if He mentions it once. If He mentions something twice, do you think it's, you know, important? Yeah. If He mentions it three times, it's very important. You better pay attention. What about seven times? He mentions it seven times this time period. So evidently, God wanted us to focus in on this time period and say, you know, something is very interesting about this time period. You need to take heed and understand what was going on. And it was a, the reign of papal supremacy. Revelation 13 and verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. This is amazing. Revelation describes that this beast power, this little horn power, was wounded, right? It said he was wounded to death. In other words, he had a wound that led him to die. But then miraculously, what happened to him? His wound was healed, and then what happened after that? All the world would wonder after the beast. Now, can you think in your mind for just a moment, was there anyone else in the Bible that received a deadly wound, and then after that deadly wound was received, they were resurrected. Can you think of someone? His name was Jesus Christ, right? Jesus received a mortal wound. He was crucified, but then guess what? He, res he rose on Sunday morning, right? This power wants to be like Jesus so much that they're even impersonating the very, this very thing. You see that? 
They were wounded to death. The papacy died in 1798, but guess what? It was healed. And then what happened after that? Everyone seems to have forgotten the history, and they wander after the beast. Now let me show you something. This is amazing. The San Francisco Chronicle, this was in their newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the memorable document, excuse me, the autographs of the memorable document, healing the wound. This comes straight from a secular newspaper that I am absolutely positive they probably had no idea what they were saying, but it was it's like a perfect fit for Bible prophecy. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. February 11th, 1929, there was a document signed. Everything, uh, Rome was given back her religious and political power before the religious power was the only one it had at that time. But in 1929, their, their temporal power was extended to them once again, and they once again became a religio-political power. Okay? And what does the Bible say? This is amazing. It says, And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Is that what we have read from their own statements this evening? Absolutely. They say we have control over all the earth. And in the 1980s, very interesting, there was two prominent individuals, Ronald Reagan, and Pope John Paul II, who brought down communism, or at least that's what we thought, that were brought down communism and, and put an end to the Cold War. And what did this do, actually, on the political landscape of the world? This is very interesting. Before this happened, who were the big three superpowers, or actually the big two superpowers in the world today, or in the world back then? There was the United States of America, and the Russia, right? Those were the two big superpowers, right? But after this happened, who became the superpower? I hate to say it, I'm from America, I don't mean to say it in a bra braggadocious way. The only superpower that remained was the United States of America, right? In fact, recently, the word superpower has been given a new term, and that word is hyperpower. You know, I'm not proud of, I mean, I'm proud of my country, I'm proud to be an American, I love my country, but I'm not proud of what my country does sometimes, right? We do terrible things, we go and bomb places and do all sorts of things, but you know, it just perfectly fits in what the Bible says, and keep coming next week because we're going to talk about America in Bible prophecy, and you will see it with your own eyes, it's, it's right there, and um, it's very interesting how these two people, will, or not these two people, but America and the Pope will come together. Now, here is an interesting picture of the Pope with uh, former Premier Mikhail Gorbachev. And when, when, the pope was, when this Pope was alive, and he was the, the most popular Pope that ever existed. He was the most traveled Pope that ever existed. He visited everywhere. In fact, I went to see him in St. Louis, and I was very, very shocked at the, the way that people actually worshiped this man. I was surprised, to be honest. I mean, people would, they would throw themselves in front of the Pope Mobile, as it were, to get a glimpse of him, right? And I was like, wow, this, this guy, I'm sure he puts his robe on one leg and another, you know, just like I put on my pants, one leg after another. But this man was really treated as a god. In fact, interestingly, President George W. Bush praised Pope John Paul II. This is, of course, when uh, the late Pope was still alive. And he promises to defend the unborn child at the opening of the Ch John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C. Now, I appreciate the Pope's stand on, on, on abortion. I agree with that stance. But there is a problem when you put up a religious building in the political mecca of the United States of America. That is combining church and state. And it says here a little bit more detail about the cutting of the ribbon. And then we all probably remember where we were when we heard the news that Pope John Paul II passed away, right? Just a few years ago. And it was amazing to me that all the world leaders were there when the Pope died. In fact, there was weddings canceled in Great Britain of these royal dignitaries to come to be at the Pope's funeral. And um, this was the most watched funeral in the history of television. Did you know that? Every, every station you turned, I remember that, that day, I was turning on the station like, okay, um, even like uh, the, the, the Weather Channel had the Pope, I mean, every channel you can imagine had this, the Pope's funeral, right? It was a huge thing. And um, what did the Pope say near before he died? Well, he called for a new world order. In fact, he made a whole speech at the United Nations saying, 
We must put an end to the violence. We need to all come together. We need to love each other. And you know, I agree to, you know, we should end the violence. But when we end the violence, guess who's going to be at the head of this new world order? It's going to be the Pope. Not this Pope, of course, but another Pope. Now, I know that some of you may have heard these things tonight and been shocked. And you say, this guy, what is he saying? You know, I've never heard any of this before. But I want to say that I am standing on a solid platform of other great reformers in the past that have said this very same thing. Let me share with you, just in closing, this, a few of these great reformers and what they believed who the Antichrist was. Many of the great Christians of Reformation and post-Reformation times shared this view about the Antichrist. Let's take a look at just a few of them. Among adherents of this interpretation were the Waldenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Melanchthon, the Baptist theologian John Gill, the martyrs, Cranmer, Tyndale, Latimer, and Ridley. Here's one. You probably know who this gentleman is, right? It's Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther. Luther said, I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his seat is that of Satan himself. You thought I was hard on him tonight. Look, this guy was really hard, right? The papacy is a general chase by command of the Roman pontiff for purpose of running down and destroying souls. That's what Martin Luther had to say. John Calvin said, we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. That's what John Calvin said. Also, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, or one of the founders, he said, he is in an emphatic sense the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above measure. Now that's a fascinating statement. Does the Pope of Rome increase sin? Well, keep coming, you'll find out. It's, it gets pretty interesting. John Knox said that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist. And today, if you happen to travel to Germany, and one of the great cities of Germany, you will go to a, a specific town hall, and you will notice something very interesting. If you didn't know the Bible, you probably would just walk past this, like probably millions of people do every day, and not even realize what this is. If you look at it carefully, what you have are the four beasts that we looked at this evening of Daniel 7. On this side, you have two beasts and two men standing or, or laying by, by the beast, their respective beast. This man here is none other than Nebuchadnezzar. And he is with the lion, the winged lion of Babylon. This is the reformers put this up, by the way. And the another, on the other side, juxtaposed to him, you have Cyrus the Great, the leader of the Medo-Persian army. And he has the, the bear with the three ribs in his mouth. You see, the reformers knew it so well, they didn't want anyone to forget and they put it in stone so that we would never forget. And they put it right there in front of our eyes. The next man you'll see on the left side there, you might recognize him. His name is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, the Grecian king. And then beside of him you have the four leopards, or not the four-headed leopards of Daniel chapter 7, representing Greece. On the other side you have Julius Caesar with this beast with the ten horns. You see him over there? He doesn't look quite as uh, ghastly as some of the beasts you saw tonight, but it's still the same beast, right? And if you look closely at the horns of this little, of this fourth beast, you'll discover a little interesting man with a funny little hat on, and that was what the Pope used to wear back in that time. So back in these days, friends, they absolutely knew exactly who the Antichrist was. But if you want to be confused today, I give you some advice. Go to a Christian bookstore and stand in the prophecy section and you will be so confused because everyone says the Antichrist is somewhere else. But if you look at what the Bible says, it's very clear who the Antichrist power is and that it's only one person. Let's conclude by these few verses here. Let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless there comes a falling away and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God, setting himself forth that he is God. Does that verse make any more sense now, as, as you've seen the evidence displayed? It, it should make some, some sense here. So there, let's go over the last three here. He shall devour the whole earth. He will continue to the end. Dominion will be taken away at the end of time. And what did Jesus warn us, our last verse this evening? He said, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, let me just step back a moment and talk about this. If you 
were the devil, and I hate to say that, this, okay, if you were the devil, what would be the best way to deceive the whole world? Would it be to get some crazy looking being and say, worship him, he will save you? Would that be very wise of you if you were the devil? No. Or would it be wise of you to take a very pious looking figure, a very religious man, and, and say, listen to what he says. He has the answer for the plight of humanity. If you don't listen to what he says, there may be dire consequences. As I think about this objectively, and when I think about deception, deception is something that's so terrible because when people are being deceived, you know they never know it. Did you know that? When people are being deceived, they don't sit around saying, well, oh, you know, this is my 73rd day of deception of being deceived today. You know, they don't say that. They don't know. This is so deceptive that not anyone knows what, no, hardly anyone knows what is happening. And so this is why we put on seminars like this to warn people of what's coming very soon upon the world. And you may think you're here as an accident, but in the mind of God, this is no accident that you're here tonight. God has set this up in the, before you're, you were even thought of to bring you here tonight. And as we continue on, we're going to get deeper and deeper, and you will see at the very end that Jesus has an incredible solution so that we can all be ready when this crisis hits us. God bless you.